Amen. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Amen. Amazing, amazing thing. Uh, a couple guys, you know, it's funny when you're baptized. Sometimes it's experiential, meaning you have an experience, and sometimes it's not. Mm. And uh, uh, there is definitely experience going on up there. It was great. The Holy Spirit yeah. was powerful. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I pulled Peter out of the water. He says, ah, this is great. And you could just feel the Holy Spirit through it. Right? <laughs> His testimony is an outstanding testimony that there are no throwaway people in God's economy. No. Mm. Never too far gone. Never. God will pursue you to your last breath. Mm. You always have a shot at it. You know? But you've got to humble yourself. And this is what I love Mike. Well, Mike is a guy that, uh, what I didn't say is just the exponential growth he's had oh, since man. coming to the Lord. Uh, a lot of guys that kind of took their toe in the water. He has just exploded. The other night he was in the men's group with us and he's giving us this theological dissertation. I'm like, who is this guy? Where did he come from? Um, he's been hanging out with Robert, I guess. Uh, Robert had the exact same kind of growth in him. And, and, you know, James the Younger here is just like, wow, they're on fire. And what I love about our group is uh, we are all people who have suffered we are all people that know what it, what it means to need Jesus, to need Him. Amen. That's kind of what I want to talk about tonight. I want to talk about I want to talk about resiliency. Resiliency. Uh, Jesus told us that we would have trouble in this world, right? Yes. Right. He said that the world would hate you, hate me, and they're gonna hate you. Yeah. Right. So when you say you're a Christian, uh, you're gonna get that look. I have this, this shirt that Lisa bought me. It says, "I'm a pastor. Don't look so shocked." <laughs> and uh, I like wearing that in public just to see the looks. And I get a lot of sneers because I'm a Christian. And I love it. I smile at it because it's like, that's between you and God. I love this. This is great. You know, I get to advertise. You watch, you watch Byron over there. He's got, he's got like, Jesus tattooed all over him. It's great. Um, <laughs> some of us are just so not ashamed of that name. But we're going to have trouble in this world. And what I know about all of you in this room, because I know a number of you, because I know all of you pretty well, You've all had trouble, uh, deep trouble. Not, not, not they didn't put soy in my latte kind of trouble. <laughs> I'm talking deep trouble. And why I love scripture so much is all of our heroes had deep trouble. And, and, and that's why scripture says we have a high priest that can relate to us. Mm. He's been through everything we've been through and more. And what's really cool about that, when you think you're absolutely alone and there's no one in the world that can understand you, there's always Jesus, because Jesus always understands you. Mm. And there's nothing you're going through he didn't go through. So when you talk to him, even if you're wrestling with him, which I really encourage lately, is wrestle with God. Talk to him. Come reason with him. Tell him you're not happy. Be David. Where are you? What are you doing? He knows. Yeah. And that's why it's okay. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk about resiliency, though. What I love about our characters is they go through these things, and yet they're like, I know what it's like to be content in all circumstances. It's like, can you bottle that so I can drink some too? <laughs> They've gone through some things that we'll never experience, yet their faith was never shaken. And I want to talk about what that looks like. Um, we are told that Satan is the prince of this world. Right? That's, that's in uh, uh, John 14. And we're told that he's prowling around like a lion looking for someone to devour. And the image I get of that is always this. You ever watch National Geographic, those TV shows? You ever watch what the lion does? He surveys the herd and he picks one that looks either weak or slow or dumb. Mm. <laughs> Foolish, right? Not following the Lord, not staying in the pack, not staying in the fellowship, not going to church, not hanging with their brothers. And then they call that one out. And they get it farther and farther away from the herd. And he pounces. And it usually doesn't go well for that animal. Well, that's what Satan does. Yeah. He watches us. And he's waiting for one of us to get called from the herd. We have, we have a struggle. We have a crisis. We're not being resilient. We're not relying on our brothers. We start to separate a little bit. Mm -hmm. right? We start to be... Just, just the siren song of the world <coughs> and our flesh calling us. And Satan just going, yeah, do it. Mm -hmm. And then you hear those half, have those half truths, which are half lies. You don't really need to go to group tonight. You don't need to go to church tonight. There's better things for you to do. You're tired. You had a hard day. You deserve that drink. You. <laughs> yeah. 
slowly but surely, Satan's going, do it, do it, do it, to call you out. Mm -hmm. And then he's going to pounce. Yeah. Now, the stories I could tell about all of you, because mm -hmm. I know all of you, <laughs> and we've talked individually, right? And what I know is this. We should not be surprised we suffer in this world. If Satan's the prince of this world, every system in this world is his. And we are in a spiritual battle. The problem with a lot of Christians is they don't really buy into that spiritual battle piece. They don't really believe it's a spiritual battle. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they're just fat, dumb, and happy. And that's not my experience. I, I have spiritual battles every day. And I will tell you that for Pastor Brett, for those of us that are in the ministry part of this, you are attacked every moment because Satan hates us especially mm -hmm. because he doesn't want us to talk about the truth. He doesn't want you guys to get baptized. He just doesn't want that. He doesn't, he doesn't want a brother being there for you. Mm -hmm. Right? And it's a battle. But what do we learn about resiliency? So we've all, we've all had hardship. Resiliency is more than just living through it. We all live through it. You've survived 100% of whatever you've been through, right? Chances are you survive the next thing. But that's not living. Jesus says, I want you to have life. I want you to have it abundantly. That's, that's different than just living through something. And so I was looking at this. I said, well, how, how does this work? What, what, is, what is the deal here? And I, and I look at Paul. Paul suffered a lot. I don't know if you've read, read the epistles, but Paul, Paul went through a lot. And, and I'm, I'm in 2 Corinthians 11. And he says, I say again, let no man think me a fool, if otherwise yet as a fool receive me, that I may boast a little about myself. So what's happening in 2 Corinthians is he's writing to this church, and they're, they've got some people agitating against Paul. And they're saying, you're not really that an apostle. You weren't with Jesus, and you don't, you're, and, and he's like, oh, you won't, you want to, you want to talk to me about this. And in Hebrews, he says, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. I, I am, I am, like, a, I was going to be chief priest. I, I studied under Gamaliel. I know what I'm talking about. But here in 2 Corinthians, he says, um, I think they want to go to verse 23. Uh, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labor is more abundant. In stripes, getting beaten, more above measure. In prison, more frequent. In death, often. Of the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes, save one. Which meant he was whipped, beaten, 39 times. Five times he got beaten for talking about Jesus. Thrice, three times, I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. You know how they stone you in the Middle East? Yeah. They bury you in a hole and leave your head out and throw rods at your head. Mm. Until you die. Ow. Yeah, ow. <laughs> I suffered shipwreck. He was shipwrecked three times. Don't get on a boat with Paul. Night and day, I have you know, struggled. He's been in perils. He was in the water at one point when he was shipwrecked. He was in the water for a time. In weariness and painfulness and watching often, in hunger and thirst and fasting and cold and nakedness. This guy was imprisoned and, and just everything bad happened to him. And yet this is the Paul that says, I know what it's like to be uh, rich. I know what it's like to be poor. I'm content in all circumstances. He's resilient. He kept doing it. I think that by the third time I'm being beaten in a synagogue, I would say, maybe I'll change my message. <laughs> maybe my approach is wrong. <laughs> right? This guy just kept going and going and going. Tough. Resilient. Wasn't just living out, I believe in Jesus and, and let's not talk about it so nothing bad happens to me. He was resilient in terms of his faith. Jesus told him, you're going to have trouble in this world. Jesus says about Paul, I will show him how much he has to suffer for my name. How'd you like that job? Wow. If that were the job title, would you apply? Wow. <laughs> right? It's like, I don't think so. Why? How is he resilient? Well, let me tell you a couple things. Paul here is saying to the Corinthians, look, I've, I've paid my dues. I have a right to say what I'm saying. But he gives no value to it. And as Christians, this is one of the biggest mistakes we make. We give value to things that don't have value. It didn't have any value that he was stoned or beaten or shipwrecked. That he did not give that any 
value. His value was Jesus. His value was heavenly things, not earthly things. His value was not what people thought about him. His value was sharing the gospel. That was the number one thing. Now, one of the exercises I run people through is say, hey, list all the things that you value and rank them. And do it. And I said, okay, now, here's God's value system. How would God rank those things? <coughs> and you're like, oh. Because God ranks things differently than we do. And so one of the ways that we have resiliency is not to give value to things that God does not give value to. Right? So when you suffer, is there value in it? According to scripture, there is, but not like you think. It says you should rejoice in suffering because you're suffering for the name. You should be able to show everyone Christ's light. You're suffering. Your life is a crap sandwich, but you're still shining Christ's light because you got Jesus. Your security is safe. You're, it's always well with your soul. You could be having the worst day whatsoever, and yet it's a powerful day because it's about Jesus. Mike's wife's having some health issues right now down in Denver. His heart's hurting. You see him get baptized, and that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. He's giving it the proper value. He's saying, Lord, I trust you. You're sovereign. You're going to take care of my wife. I'm here being baptized because I'm going to make this commitment to you, and you're going to honor it. Amen. That's the right way. Amen. That's the right value. Sometimes we give value to our, uh, what I'll call our worst angels. Sometimes we give value to my instant gratification of something I want or need. Sometimes we give value to someone saying something about us. Sometimes we give value in our marriages to things that shouldn't have value. We get upset. And what we learn from Paul here is, look, all this stuff happened to me, but that doesn't have any value. What has value is I'm going to share Jesus Christ. Because every time I get stoned, every time I get beaten, every time I'm shipwrecked, every time I'm in jail, I'm in jail because I told something about Jesus. That has value. Right? Never confuse the means and the end. I was with someone today, Byron and I were talking to this young woman who wants to do a, a business, a nonprofit. She wants to do P, B, and J, peanut butter and Jesus. She's going to have a food truck, and she's going to go around and feed homeless people mm. peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and have a table talking about Jesus. That's, okay. and that's a great thing. And, I, and I, when we were talking to her, and Byron was really grilling her a little bit, because we wanted to make sure that the means and the end were the right thing. The end is always Jesus. Mm -hmm. The means is the peanut butter sandwich and, and the truck. Yeah. But we've all seen people go out to the homeless community, and they feed them, and they think, wow, we've done a great thing for Jesus. Did you ever mention his name? No. <laughs> they knew we were from the church. <laughs> and I tell people, I can feed you every single day, but if I don't talk to you about Jesus, you're still going to hell. You'll have a full stomach. And I'm going to be held accountable because I never shared Jesus with you. So we love this young woman because she's got it right. She understands that this is a means to an end, and the end is Jesus. Which is why she can be resilient. She can have business fellows and all sorts of things because she'll understand that it's the end that matters, not the means. So you've got to get your head straight. That's one of, one of the first things I learned about resilience is get your head straight. Don't value the things that aren't, aren't valuable. Right? If I wanted to put it in my military mind, you know, so what if your tushy hurts? Drive on. <laughs> right? Here's another thing. Jesus says that the world's going to hate us because they hated him. If Satan is the prince of this world and every system is made by him, why do we care about this world? Amen. Mm. Why does that mean that? Why, why do we try so hard to perform and, and, and prove? You know, men especially, you know, first thing we do when we meet each other, hey, we shake hands, right? And what's the first thing out of our mouth? What do you do? What do you do? What do you do? And that's not a question. That's a pecking order. I'm trying to figure out if I'm more important than you. Or you're more important to me. That's Satan's, that's Satan's way. Mm -hmm. Right? And, and, and so what I see here is the world's going to hate us. What I see is, look, the things of this world are corrupt. And that, that we shouldn't expect anything good from this place. But God is gracious. He gives us good things. He gives us relationship. It's not good for man to be loved. He gives us, he gives us fellowship, brotherhood. He, 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 gives us, he gives us the church. He gives, in, this, in this horribly fallen place, he gives us some really good things. But what's the focus of it? Yeah. Him. Amen. Him. 
The moment you get away from being focused on Jesus, you will no longer be resilient. Mm -hmm. The world will grind you. I mean, honestly, in the ministry, there's this great meme I love. It has this guy that's like 90 years old. He says, I'm a pastor. I feel great. I'm only 42. Uh, you know, this is a grind sometimes. But so long as you got your eyes on the prize, which is Jesus, you will be resilient. You will overcome. Yes. I, I always feel bad for pastors. My pastor's here, Pastor Brett. And it's amazing what people will say to pastors after they preach or Monday morning or how they treat them. And, I, and I'm stunned. I kind of grew up in the Catholic church a little bit, and it's liturgical. You would never say that to a priest. But what you do to a pastor uh, is, is they treat them as if like they're just one of the sheep. And we've just decided to put you up front. And they don't get that, that the pastor is an anointed office. One of three, prophet, priest, and king. And he's not the sheep. He's the shepherd. And he has authority over the sheep to lead them. And, and, and it's a grind. I mean, I watch this man. And I love him. And it, it's hard. But here's what I also know. He loves Jesus. And his main goal is Jesus. And he knows when he dies, he's going to meet Jesus. He's not going to meet congregants or sheep. He's not going to meet me. And sometimes I'm a thorn in the side. He has to say during services, this is a rhetorical question, Tom, because I like to shout out. <laughs> Don't expect good things. Outside of Jesus. You're going to get what you get. If you, if you step outside of Jesus, hey, you're on the road. Good luck. Mm -hmm. Let me know how it works out for you. Right? Paul has this great line in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Go find it real quick here. He talks about his life. 418. Okay. He talks about being crushed, you know, but, but not, not destroyed. Paul had a hard life. Discouraged. Perplexed. He says, I'm perplexed. Everyone perplexed. You're just sitting there with God going, I have no idea what you're doing with me. I have no idea what's happening in my life. I have no idea what's happening in my business. I, I don't get why I can't get a job. I don't understand. I'm perplexed. But with God, he says, but I'm not, I'm not giving up. <laughs> because I know you're victorious. I know if you're already won. I can be resilient because you are resilient. I can have your resiliency. Now, i got to be honest. In my own power, I am a weakling. I got no patience, I got no resilience, I got no love, I got nothing. I, I'm a nothing burger. But when Jesus is in me, when I'm abiding in him, he's abiding in me. He works through me and gives me the strength to do all things through him. Amen. So what I tell people is, you know, they, they say, Tom, oh, your ministry is so great, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, I'm nothing. All I'm doing is showing people Jesus comes through me. The love I share is not my own. My own my love is inadequate. The love of Christ is, is powerful. And so what happens is, because I love Christ, he, he, he wants to love you. He, he works through me and says, Tom, let me show you this person through my eyes. Because your love's inadequate, but mine's not. Now, who can't be resilient under those circumstances? How many of you, though, try to do it in your own power? Yeah, that's where we get in trouble. Mm. The moment we leave Jesus and say, I've got this one. <laughs> Car goes off the road, crashes. He goes through the windshield. It never works out in our own power. It may work out for a while, right? I see people make it work out for a while, but it always crashes. And so what I see about resiliency, you've been through something really tough. And if you guys were to sit down and tell your worst stories, uh, you, you would, you would A, have a lot in common, B, uh, you'd be shocked by each other's resiliency. You want to live life abundantly for Christ. This world will drag you down and spit you out. But when Christ is the center of your life, there's a logic to things. Your suffering has purpose. I always tell people that your, your greatest ministry comes from your greatest pain. God says, I will, do, I will use all things for the good of those who love me. So you've had a hard thing? Great, I will use it. You, 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 want, to, you want to work with me? 
I think of my buddy Scott. None of you know him. I know him. I'm not going to tell you a story, but God uses him powerfully because of his hardship. Not despite it. If you didn't have your history, you wouldn't be working for the Lord. The young woman we met today, yeah. the reason she's in the faith is because she had a hardship. <coughs> and because it was so bad, she says, the only thing I think of is going to church. She wasn't in the church. She was like, I didn't know what to do, so I went, I went to church. Now she wants to do PP and J. Amen. Right on. So what I'm getting to is, what I'm seeing as I'm reading the scriptures, is the only way you have resiliency in anything is Jesus. Amen. Mm -hmm. Because I can fake my way through it. We've done that, right? We faked our way through it. I'm picking on you. And it's sustainable only for so long. <laughs> we only have so much power and authority and, and ability and, and, and energy to sustain it. And eventually... There's an economic term called the utility. It goes like this. You eventually just peter out. You can't do it. You ever seen a Coke bottle when you shake it up? Mm -hmm. That's what happens when you do it on your own. You're the Coke bottle. And eventually your bottle will fill up, and that will shake. But with Jesus, you don't have that. You have resiliency because you're like, I'm going through this hardship, and I, but I know God's in charge. And I know he's got control, and I know he's going to use this somehow, and I know that, that he is with me, walking with me. I'm not alone. He understands completely. And you know what? I can shout at him if I want to. I can just go, what is going on here? And he'll answer. Have you ever had that? God answer you? Doesn't that surprise you sometimes? You're just ranting. I had that coolest thing happen to me. It was the stupidest little thing in the world. I had this coat on like I bought, and the zipper broke on it. Got a double zipper on And I really like this coat. It was really frustrating that the zipper wouldn't work. So this morning, it's cold out. I got this coat on. I'm just going to wear it open. But I need to close it. The rain's in. And I said, God, I said, you know, Lord, can you do me, do me a solid here and just make this coat work? Amen. It didn't work yesterday. Amen. And I'm like, yes. <laughs> See, in my life, God is so active and so real. He helps me with my coat. Amen. Yeah. I don't just ask him for the big things. He is a part of every moment of my day. Yeah. What should I buy the guys tonight for dinner? Chicken. Chicken. Which bean <laughs> should I get? I ask him about everything. He's that much integrated into who I am. <laughs> now, some of you know my story, and you would say I'm very resilient. And I am. Only because of Jesus. By the grace of God, I go. Amen. Right? So when I look at this, you have to know who you are in Christ. You want to be resilient. You want to go through worship. You want to struggle. You want to, you want to live in this fallen world. And you want to have life and have it abundantly. you got to know who you are in Christ. Amen. You are an heir to the throne. You are a daughter of the Most High. You are a friend of Jesus. You are someone he loved enough to die on a cross for you. It's amazing. Right? So when you get this idea of saying, who am I in Christ? Not who am I in, in me. Yeah, I, I suck. I, I don't even like me. <laughs> I always joke that if I were God and I was going to make a Tom, I wouldn't have done it. <laughs> <laughs> but something about God, he wants me. He doesn't just love you. He likes you. <clears throat> now think about that for a second. He doesn't just love you. He likes you. He wants to be around you. He wants a relationship. You want to be resilient? You make him that much a part of your life. Amen. Scripture says, what can man do to me? And that's about value again. Sure, you can fire me. You can, you can harm me. You can steal all my stuff. You can do whatever. Right? You can abuse me. You can manipulate me. You can take advantage of me. Yeah. It's always well with my soul. Because when I die, I get to be in front of Jesus. Mm. Amen. And he's going to ask me very specific questions. Hey, what did you do with those gifts I gave you? Hey, remember that time that guy was abusing you? <laughs> did you think of me? Did you show him who I was? Or were you so, so worried about yourself and being selfish? Remember that time you got to shine my light and you didn't because... 
I think about it all the time. Probably because I'm getting older and I know my meeting with him's coming up. You know, when I was in my 20s, that meeting seemed like a long way away. But now that I'm in my mid 50s, it's like, <laughs> that meeting could be any day. I want to have the right answers for that meeting. It's the most important meeting in my life. So, what can man do to me? So, I don't worry about that. I don't put value on that. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. Resiliency comes from the idea that you, A, know things are going to happen to you that are not good because you're a Christian and Satan's prowling around and he wants to kill you. B, resiliency comes because you know God's got your back and no matter what happens in this world, you win. C, resiliency comes from the fact that you are part of an army. A Christian army. Yes. A fellow believers that stand side by side with you. They pray for you. They will, they will walk with you. They will, they will be in those worst times with you. You're never alone. And resiliency, D, comes from the fact that everything's about Jesus. And I can smile about everything when I put it in the right perspective. If I don't get distracted and think about how unhappy I am with this, or that's not working there, or that person's driving me crazy. <laughs> if I put it in perspective and say, it's all about Jesus, I can withstand any storm. There's this great meme that said, devil came and whispered, I'm coming. And I whispered back, I love your eggs. <laughs> devil eggs. Yeah. Someone wrote back and said, I like his cake too. <laughs> we have nothing to fear. We are sons and daughters of the Most High. We are heirs to the throne. We are holy and righteous in his sight. We've been anointed. Why not be bold? Why not be resilient? Why not go out and shout his name from the rooftops? What can they do to me? What can they do? Yeah. That's resiliency. So don't just live your life sucking it up and thinking that's good enough. Because that's not what Jesus wants you to do. Jesus said, you'll have trouble in this world. What I want you to do is live a life and have it abundantly. And the only way you have that is abide me and I'll abide you. And I will <coughs> be your strength when you are weak. I will. I will. You won't. Every time you do, you <laughs> will fail. But I will do these things for you. And that's where true power comes from. And that's where true resiliency comes from. And you can overcome any storm relationally, personally, financially, emotionally, spiritually. You can overcome everything. Jesus is the center of your life. Which is why guys like Byron and Pastor Brett and me and Scott and all the guys in here, we are pounding you with Jesus. Because we know the experience. We know what it's like to be on the other side and struggle and have hardship. And we know what happened to all those hardships once Jesus came in and became the center of it. There was healing. There was power. There was, there was spiritual fundamental change. Amen. Amen. Supernatural stuff. Yeah. I can't explain. But I can tell you this. You want to live a life abundantly in this world? Put Jesus number one. Amen. Let everything flow from him. Amen. And your life will change. Amen. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.